sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night. I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. It's interesting. I mean, the roles music played in my life vary depending on what period of my life I'm in. So in other words, in, in school, it was identity. Who am I? Where do I fit in? Who understands me? You know, in, uh, in grade school, we're talking about uh, it's finding that through music, you know, who, who other people who feel like they don't fit in, other people who deal with sadness, other people who deal with being misunderstood, <laughs> you know, those, those, those uh, uh, feelings of ostracism and loneliness and disconnection uh, and, not, and not fitting in and not belonging. So, so to me, music was that identity and maybe healing uh, at, at that age. Um, and that's probably where I resonate with. That's probably what started it all. Where I resonate with it the most, and then, and then, and then it's interesting. And then, like maybe fast forward later to when I'm a music critic at the New York Times and the Rolling Stone, and suddenly instead of feeling it, which you're still feeling it, you're also analyzing. You know, you sort of change your relationship to it because now your job is not just to feel it and, and see how it relates to your own life, but to help other people understand how's this going to relate to their life. How does this uh, concert or piece of music fit into the band's history as a arc as a whole as artists how does it fit into the the genre as a whole how does it fit into the culture as a whole so now that heart piece is being combined with the sort of head piece and that starts to change your your relationship with it for a long time uh and uh then then maybe the next shift is then when i'm maybe interviewing artists for rolling stone and now i'm not understanding trying to understand just how the music works but how does the artist work what makes them tick? Why do they choose to make this particular piece of music? How does this resonate with the rest of their lives? Like, who are they as a, as a person that created this? And so it's really been an evolving and changing relationship you know, and, a, and, re, and a really important sustaining relationship. I mean, it, some of the things that you've had the opportunity to do uh, in your life, uh, which it's not like you were handed this opportunity on a plate. You make stuff happen uh, for yourself. Uh, but who are some of the musicians uh, that you have kind of either written books about uh, or written articles about who, you know, when you're looking back, you are most proud of? Yeah, I'd like the thing that, get, that comes to my right way, I don't know why it just gave me chills. I was thinking about was just, it was Chuck Berry. Like, Hunter, I've got, you know, I've had the opportunity to meet so many ama amazing incredible like artists and musicians but to meet like I, I knew when I was writing for Rolling Stone there were certain people that may not be with us much longer and I really wanted to interview and spend some time with Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Bo Diddley, the maybe arguably the three people who sort of are, are the genesis of rock and rock and roll so uh, and, and I remember they're all incredible experiences but I remember Chuck Berry specifically I was told that, um, you know, I was told he doesn't do interviews. There's no guarantee it'll happen. You know, he is very likely to just walk in and then walk out after a minute. So just expect nothing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I was really nervous. I was really over-prepared and, 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 uh, um, and uh, I, 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 I don't know if I've said this before, but it is true. I brought along someone I was dating at the time just with me because I knew he like, has an appreciation of, of women, I guess, and I thought he'd be more likely to stay if the, if there was like a female energy in the room. So, I, so, uh, so I, I sort of, and uh, and I met him, and we got along like incredibly. Like we just had the best time 
uh, and and he was just so he was just so funny. And I I go back and I think I try to remember. I know it's in the that book I read. Everyone loves you when you're dead. But there was a moment when we clicked and we knew it was going to be great. I forgot what it was, but I think he said something funny, and I laughed at his joke or something. And 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 once we were the, the laughter started, it all began, and I realized, you know. You, under, you, you learn about rock and roll and how it's created or music or anything. You read about books and you have theories, but when you meet the person, you actually get to really understand it. And so a few things I got was one, he's just really an entertainer. Like he's a, he's a, he's, he's like almost like a failed stand-up comedian, you know? And, and the Chuck Berry song, I think it's my dingling, I forget, you know, which is like <laughs> seen as a novelty hit. Like he loves that song. That to him is as important, you know, <laughs> as Roll Over Beethoven or so, you know, as, as a, you know, as all as Maybelline or something, you know, Maybelline is like the one all the critics like and all the serious musicians, it's certainly one of the greatest songs of all time. Uh, but my dingling, which is this novelty thing, that's he loves that song. It's just funny and people love it and they laugh. And and, and I realized that that. Uh, so that was the first sort of interesting thing. Like he really he kept saying to me, like, you and I could do 15 minutes in Vegas, like as a stand up show. Like he, <laughs> he was just so and he was playing me his songs and we we're cutting up and after the interview, he called me up and had wanted me to come to his like his uh, his place out there. It was it was the greatest moment we spent like hour. It went from like maybe you'll get five or 15 minutes or a minute to like spend like maybe four. The longest interview he'd ever done, maybe in at least three decades or longer. It was unbelievable. And the other incredible. So the two other incredible things are one is. When I talk to other people who were around at that time, they were all saying, I invented rock and roll. I invented it. I'm not getting the credit. Chuck Berry was like, I didn't invent anything. I just took what came before me. And I love that sort of modesty when you, when really in a lot of ways he, he did. And, and when you ask him, you know, there are all these theories and how it was invented. And he said, you know, he would play these segregated venues and, you know, there's the white audience on one side and the black audience, on the other side. And, and the white audience wanted to hear the R and B. The black audience wanted to hear what he called it was called the time the hillbilly music and he sort of like had to please them both and he sort of made this combination r b and like you know and, and and sort of country and like and came up with rock and roll trying to just please this you know this this audience in this time and moment in, in the culture it was so fascinating to get from his perspective and completely different than anything you'd maybe ever read in a history book we think we understand things but we don't you know, till we really, really get to the first person sources. Oh yeah, that's, I mean, Chuck Berry, people talk about artists and Chuck Berry, you know, there's so many funny anecdotes about him, you know, essentially being uh, a rather unsavory character. Like, uh, you know, that there's that famous anecdote of him punching Keith Richards when Keith Richards touched his uh, guitar. And there's all sorts of, um, you know, anecdotal stuff about, uh, Chuck Berry refusing to use a backing band, uh, a regular backing band, and and not playing till he got given bags of cash and uh, all the rest of it. But it, your experience with him shows that people are not like black and white, uh, either good or bad. And maybe some of the stuff is uh, that's bad about him is exaggerated. Who knows? But people aren't or, linear things. Go ahead. Go ahead. They're they're not just good or bad. People are good and bad, and you know that's kind of important for us to realize today, I think. Or, or there's a logical reason behind what they're doing. So let's discuss what you said about Chuck Berry. So first of all, if you go watch, like I think it's all hail rock and roll when he gets in the fight with Keith Richards, is that what it's called? Uh, I, might, you, I haven't actually seen the documentary. Yeah, so, so if you watch it, Chuck Berry's actually right. They're trying to mess with, if I recall correctly, if you look at, it, look at the situation where he's right, like where they're trying to mess with like the way he likes to do stuff and he likes to do it his way. And secondly, think about this. Imagine, imagine you've been around in a time where, where you're always getting ripped off. Mm. You're always getting taken advantage of. You're being treated like a, you know, not like a human being. Uh, and, 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 you're, and, and it's really crooked and there's no recourse. And so you start to make rules for self-protection. You know, we do this in life. Like, right, if, uh, if uh, somebody, if you trust somebody with some money and they rip you off, and they take and disappear. Next time you're like, oh, I'm gonna make that person write an IOU, right? They write an IOU and they still take off. Well, next time I'm gonna get the money in advance or something and then do it. So all his things, he started as a fresh slate and then he's getting ripped off by all these club owners with no recourse whatsoever. So he starts to make, make or has other things going wrong. So he starts to make rules 
based on each one that allow him to survive. So it's just the detritus of these experiences in life. And suddenly you're like, oh, he's not just cantankerous and difficult to deal with. No, he's had a lot of bad experiences. So he's trying to figure out what works for him. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the things you're saying are true, but they actually make sense if you're in his head. Yeah, or if you've had to live through what he's had to, to live through, uh, there's nothing worse, is, especially for a guy who, despite his modesty, is extraordinarily influential on everybody, not least Keith, Keith Richards. And uh, to be fair to Keith Richards, he tells that story like lovingly, almost as if it, it made him love him even more. Uh, yeah. He couldn't be more complimentary about Chuck uh, Berry. But, you know, like, he spent if he spent ages being ripped off then all of that stuff is fair enough and it's a good point that you make that we should try and see things from other people's perspective but you mentioned that you had met uh, some other kind of forefathers of rock and rock and roll and like other amazing people what were your experiences like with them man i love i don't know man it's like it's funny chuck berry and bo diddley are just one of my favorite people in the world and 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 bo diddley and chuck berry and a lot of the innovators i met shared something that great creators and innovators do, which is a sense of enthusiasm, a sense of excitement, and a sense of play. One of my biggest, so, so when I met Bo Diddley, like we went to a studio and he was like, because you know, there are certain people who have a glory days, then they spend the rest of their life trying to relive or recapture, recreate that glory moment. There are a lot of musicians like that. But Bo Diddley, he was still inventing new, mus- new instruments. He was showing me all the new instruments he invented. Then he went to a studio and he started a drum machine up. And he starts like, you know, rhyming on top of it, you know, and then he like, he, then he would put on a funny wig. I think put on like a heavy metal wig and started like doing fake metal stuff for a while. And then like, and then he started making up a rhyme about me. And I'm like, this guy, he loves music. He like loves play. He loves to tinker. And he still has that spirit. I tried so hard before he passed away, you know, Chuck passed too. Uh, and I wonder, I gotta, I don't know. I gotta see if those recordings he played me come out, but, but, uh, I wanted someone to get in there and just record almost like a cool indie album with him because he was doing this incredible, like homemade, just original stuff. It's almost imagine like indie rock slash indie hip hop combined with like where it all came from, the dozens in the street on Maxwell Street in Chicago of people just doing, you know, you, you know, your mama rhymes and things like that and, you know, insulting rhymes about each other. And, and, uh, uh, and it was just, it was the most incredible thing. I know those recordings still exist, but I really wanted to get someone in there to, to capture that. And um, I'm sad that's lost, but wow. just incredible. Wow. And, and in terms of like how you, uh, why did you want to, to conduct interviews with these people uh, and, and how difficult uh, was it to arrange these things? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, yeah it's in, I mean, I think the, the, the why is always curious, for me, it's curiosity. Curiosity motivates everything. Like, you know, when you find something you love, the Lubin brothers is another example. You know, I, uh, I uh, you know, you find something you love, like, where did that come from? Who even thought of that? And how do they even think of it at that time, like what was going on, like uh, with the Leuven brothers, uh, and for those who don't know the Leuven brothers, they were just a seminal early country act. And I'll tell you a quick story that's sort of like, that is one of my favorite Leuven brothers song stories is they once um, were doing a show and there's this kind of guy, out, guy outside and like, I think overalls and no shirt, I'm doing this from memory, so I might have a couple of details wrong, but overalls, no shirt and just su- super tan, like he's just been working out, not like he's been super tan in the sense that he's just, dirty and been working out working out outside doing a lot of manual labor and, and, he, and the guy couldn't afford a ticket to their concert and uh and they walked past and i think they were like you know eating crackers because they're on the run on the road you don't get a lot of nutrition and they talked to him outside and i think they let him in the show and years later uh they were on tour and johnny cash came up to them and he goes oh you know that guy outside your concert that was me and he said i saw you eating crackers and i thought that's how you guys got your voices like that so I started eating crackers afterward because I wanted to sing like you all did. <laughs> um, so that just shows you the influence of the Lubin brothers. And they're one of my, you know, I think one of the greatest, um, but between listening to their music, their songs, uh, like the album Tragic Songs of Life, and then their album cover of Satan is Real. And if you're listening and haven't looked it up, just Google the album cover Satan is Real. It's the greatest album cover of all time. Um, 
that you're just like, where did that come from? What did you think of, what's the story behind that album cover? Like this, these ballads and murder ballads and tragic songs of life, what made you think of recording them? How'd you get your harmonies like that? And then, you know, the stories of Charlie and Ira Leuven and one was the really good brother and one was the really evil brother. And, you know, you can almost see it as a movie. So at that time I, uh, I got Charlie Leuven. I had a, was, I had a publishing company. So I had Charlie Leuven uh, get together with a writer and write book and tell his story, which happened before he passed away. Um, so to me, it's like curiosity and also wanted to tell the story. It's the stories that haven't been told so that they're forever when, when Chuck isn't here, when Bo Diddley isn't here, when, uh, you know, Charlie Lubin isn't here. Like if those stories aren't captured, they're, they're just gone and we lose history. Yeah. I mean, I, I hadn't heard of the Lubin brothers before, uh, you highlighted them in your playlist. And I've got to say, uh, this is a mixture, the uh, list of songs that you sent me between songs that I'm already extremely familiar with and would be some of my favorites as well. And then stuff that I've really enjoyed discovering. It seems to me that your taste in music's uh, quite similar to mine. Would you say that uh, rock, and, and I mean, obviously there's, there's some different stuff there. There's, there's a Bob Marley track. Uh, there's, there's, you, you clearly love um, soul music as well. But is, 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 does it come down to your music taste? Uh, do you gravitate quite a lot towards kind of uh, rock, soul? And it seems quite a lot, um, you know, quite a lot of organic instrumentation, traditional uh, pop songwriting and that type of thing. Yeah, no, it's, inter it's, it's a really interesting. I thought about it when you, because originally you asked the list of like my five favorite albums. Yeah. I was about to send you that. And then I thought, well, a great album might be different than the greatest songs because an album is sort of like a work within itself and the great and also we're kind of like the the era of the album is almost over as far as like you know or it's, it's very rare that these these eight sets are the suite of of, uh, of amazingness and i thought well it really would leave out you know in other words if you asked for my favorite albums that would be maybe a different looking list than the list of my favorite songs or 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 or, or, or what i think are the greatest songs i've recorded and then if you said tell me what you're into for different moods that might be different so maybe maybe i sent you that list of the greatest songs but maybe what i listened to over the last month would be, would be completely different. different than that list and so if you ask me what what's tell me the last five songs you listened to it would be like maybe completely different genres it might be it i know it would be it'd be more sort of like uh electronic more minimalist classical uh nothing like what i sent you the list of because depending on what the ask is, the list becomes very different. And yeah. so to, but the short answer to your question is, is uh, you know, it really depends on the mood, uh, on the mood I'm in. But I think probably with the greatest songs, a lot of them are those formative things, you know, like Louis Armstrong, St. James Infirmary, these things started a whole maybe genre or are the greatest example of that style. Where, yeah. where, whereas um, if you're talking about more, you know, what, what I put, like a lot of the sort of electronic stuff I'm listening to or more mood stuff, if it's Nils Fromm or Emancipator or uh, um, uh, Weave All or some of those other artists that I'm into, Gage, all these little artists I'm into, I wouldn't put them on the greatest songs of all time. But if you wanted to come over and say, turn me on to something cool and new or that feels good, I'd play you that. So it's interesting. But I like, but I wonder if our tastes when we talk about the greatest songs where it almost narrows our categories to certain... Mm, yeah, well, I guess it's interesting that you said about uh, narrowing it down to your formative years, because it does seem like a lot of people, the thing that really has the most sentimental meaning to them is stuff that they grew up on or stuff that they really enjoyed in their teenage years. Uh, that seems to be like when people have to choose like the greatest songs or whatever, but it's all people choose greatest songs, people choose greatest albums, people do uh, do the podcast in different ways. It's mainly just to get a snapshot of what um, you know, yeah. amazing, interesting people uh, listen to. I want I want to uh, ask you because I well oh, I'm posting. Yeah, and by the way, we got. Can we discuss that Lubin Brothers song for a second? Did you listen to Knoxville Girl? Yeah, I loved it. But what? But why did you choose that song specifically? Because it seems like, you know, I'm I'm gonna fall down this rabbit hole now. Uh, <laughs> the Lubin Brothers, uh, and particularly the album uh, Satan Is Real. The cover is. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I mean, it's wicked. It's it's also to come to come out with a cover like that in 1960. I guess would have been really unorthodox. Yeah, and and the cover just so everyone can. You know, I mean, I'm sure you'll Google it, but it's these the Lubin brothers. I think they're both wearing white suits, and they're standing behind like a giant cardboard cut out of Satan, but it's not like the great greatest artistically. It's almost like a pathetic looking cardboard cover of Satan. And then there's like fire. I think they burn tires for the fire underneath them. And it's just such a, it's such, you know, it's such a dark, it's a very fire and brimstone kind of cover. And then Satan is real as a title. You know, it's so, uh, it's so dark. And then when you think about their histories that Ira Lubin really struggled with these demons himself. Uh, but while it's the greatest co- album cover and Satan is real and the kneeling drunkard's prayer, I think are these great songs tragic songs of life which is a more dull cover is is to me their greatest music and knoxville girl specifically is one of like the great murder ballads of all time you know i, I you know so many people from elvis costello i think johnny cash um uh who else uh, i was just thinking of someone uh covered it um like someone led, legendary there's so many legend oh, elvis I, uh, there are a few others anyway so many legendary covers Cover, covers of, uh, of, of Knoxville Girl. Um, it's, it's just one of the greatest murder ballads of all time. You, if you listen to the lyrics, it's just so crazy. It's so, it's almost like predates other genres where this person goes walking with their partner and then literally murders them for no reason that you can tell. Maybe there's a line, go down, go down, my Knoxville girl with the dark and roving eyes, I think it is. Maybe her eye wandered. I don't know, but it's just the most, it's almost like Johnny Cash's um, uh, Folsom Prison Blues. You know, I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. It's one of those early, you know, and it wasn't, it was a traditional song, but it's one of those very, it's just, there's, there's a darkness to it, but they sing the, in this kind of bright way. And it, it's just, it's a really wild when you listen to the lyrics and they're close harmonies. Uh, just give you the chills. Yeah, I, I can't believe I hadn't heard of them uh, before. And I wanted to ask you about some of the other acts uh, that I hadn't heard of on this list as well, because yeah. I'm posting the full um, list below in the show notes. Oh, cool. Uh, it's full of classic songs, but I want to focus in on some of the stuff that my audience might be less familiar with. Uh, who was who Cesaria Evora? And, oh my god and, and uh why did you choose pity pay yes oh she's a so she's a singer from the cape verde islands and i love I don't know, it's funny man i have such a relationship with these songs i get the chills when i talk about them it's really interesting but she you know it's like happy sad i love happy sad music for some reason so it's got this sort of nice kind of rhythm that 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 you can almost want to sort of slow you know do a nice dance step to and then at the same time, the lyrics are very mournful about, I don't, I don't know the exact translation, but a lot of music is about kind of homesickness. And she's called the Barefoot Diva, performs in bare feet. And there's just the way, if you listen to it, it comes in with this beautiful rhythm and, and, and melody. And then there's this moment, boom. And then she starts singing this full, just, just this full, full voice, like that's just resonates with you. And, and it's just, uh, I mean, she has a lot of great songs, Petit Pais and, and Sodad, I think are the, are the big ones. But this one, just the way the rhythm comes in, then boom, the way she kicks in uh, with her voice, it just like, you just feel it on such a deep level. It's just one of those songs that, I think the other reason why they tend to be older songs on these lists, it's like, what song do you still love after listening to it for 10 years? You know, like, yeah. um, you know, like I might like, well, I don't know, The weekends. love listening to The weekend. love listening to like uh, Juice World. I love listening to like some of this stuff. But like, and maybe I'll listen to a couple of songs in 10 years, like Kanye's 808 and Heartbeats, uh, 808, and Heart, 808 and Heartbreak. Like yeah, that yeah. album, I, I still listen to 10 years later. Not everyone loves that album, but it's grown yeah, out of the no, I think like, it's, it, was, it was kind of ahead of its uh, time, really. Uh, basically, yeah. put all, all the music in the charts uh, for the ensuing decade or more kind of is basically derivative of that in, in yeah. my yeah, no, no, I think, I think, I think so too, and, I, and it's just a full album and a full mood, and not. But you see, well, what am I still listening to, ten years later? And those things tend to make the greatest. There often is sort of a time gap. Often, I'll find that the things maybe in the New York Times I put in my top ten list of that year. I look back on, I'm like, oh god, I don't need to listen to that anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I know what you mean, uh, and there is a timelessness uh, to, uh, and you know, w- 
I want again. I want to f- focus on the tunes that I'm less familiar with, but um, yeah, but, you know, tunes yeah. Like God, tunes like God only knows or, or things that I already love. There's a timelessness to that. That, to be honest, yeah. as much as you know, same same as you, I loved the weekend after hours. I thought that was a, a great record. Do I think it's as classic as the long and winding road or God only knows? I mean, probably not. To be honest, yeah. uh, you know, that's just me. But I think me- much of the audience will will w- would agree with that. Uh, is there anything that you've heard? Uh, this is a bit of a, a side a side note, but is there anything that you've heard in the last couple of years uh, that that you thought, okay, this is like as good as the Beatles or Sam Cooke? Yeah, that's a, it's a tough question because maybe I don't compare to that note, but I would say, is there something? If the question was, I'll restate the question: Is there something, is there something you've heard the last few years that's just stuck with you and stayed with you in the same way that some of those have? I would say the Nils Fromm, Nils Fromm song says. Uh, and it, and again, it's very, I, I do have a bent toward minimalism. Um, it's, it's almost like a, I want to, it's, it's, it's a six minute, give or take a couple minutes piece. And it just grows and grows and grows and sort of like, just sort of, uh, sort of, sort of sinks in. So I'd say, uh, him, I know I've mentioned him like a, like a couple of times. Um, I, I love the Tov, uh, uh, this is the Tov Lo song, not habits. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what the lyric is. Uh, it's um, I can look it up in a second. There's like a Tovalo single uh, that I literally listen to all the time that I love, but I will listen to it in 10 years. I, I I don't know, but there's certain songs I know that I like listen to on like repeat a lot. Uh, We've All, which is a little bit more electronic. I know I mentioned them earlier. The song Give Me Some just like really resonates um, with me. But we're in a funny time in music where I think because of Spotify and the way the recommendations work, there are people have song, an artist and maybe one song by that artist they like, and that's almost their entire consumption of that artist. Yeah, I don't know whether that's our attention spans or the fact that we can just hop easily between different artists, but it's, there's a type of like uh, fandom or fan, yeah, fandom uh, that, that gets, I don't know, I find it a bit more satisfying when I know an artist's catalogue to the extent of knowing like all their deep cuts and, you know, their crap albums from the 80s and, you know, whatever it might be, uh, rather than just knowing like one song. And with new acts, when I only know one song by them, I feel like I don't know, I don't know them well enough and I don't know like what they stand for just if I know some kind of like hit single that's gone viral on TikTok I don't know whether you feel like that about artists yeah or 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 it's a slightly a slight variation of that which is what it'll be is you'll go deep till I mentioned Weavile earlier I don't know why I'm just mentioning them as I don't know uh, because they're at the forefront of my mind so with Weavile I kind of went deep but there are really only four songs I loved but maybe I listened to 20 you know, but there were just four songs I love. So I'm like, cool, those are the four Weavall songs. And I maybe didn't go deeper than the 20 because the de- returns started to be diminishing. But then you take, I don't know if you like Ratatat. Um, I realized that I'm like, like a lot of my stuff lately is, as you can tell, it has a more, slightly more electronic, slightly more minimalist bent, uh, but they're amazing. And like, the, like, you know, but I went, it just kept getting good. I find that, you know, their, their, their bootleg album of hip hop remixes where they took all these great classics and put their music underneath it, or they did a remix of this band, The Knife. Uh, we share our mother's health. That's just like mind blowingly good. So with them, like I went into the deep cuts because it kept giving gold, you know, it's like you're mining and you kept getting gold. So you mine deeper others you mine and it's just dirt, dirt, dirt underneath the gold on top and you stop mining. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, well, I guess, I guess for some people, the stuff that you only find like a few good tunes that you like for some others, that that's, that's where they go. That's where they go deeper. I mean, everybody's got, got a different taste, but I guess, do you think that, do you think there's a culture like there was in the same way when, when we had consumption of physical media, do you think there's a culture for people of getting, you know, going really deep with albums and listening to albums on repeat? I mean, I guess there must be, I think it must be a misconception that people don't, um, treasure things as much as they used to because if that was the case then how would people like the weekend who we were talking about or billy eilish or whoever it is stream hundreds of millions of times i mean there's going to be a lot of people just listening to that on repeat right or you know what it might be is it's like a sense of the medium is the message right so if you go to the early days you're listening to live music right so you go pre 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 pre-recorded media 
and you're just listening to live music. So a piece is going to be a, you know, a Beethoven, a symphony, and it's about as long as an audience's attention span, right? Maybe that's whatever it might be, 30 minutes to two hours for a piece. But now then, then they create 78s, right? I, I have like this amazing Edison phonograph, one of my most prized possessions with like a little diamond head. That's how they would play the records before you had the, the needle 78s or maybe around the same time. Um, but, you know, you had a 78. So it's like you would make an A side and then you make a B side, right? And, and that's it. And maybe it's whatever the length is, three and a half minutes. And that's how we have the pop songs being three and a half minutes. Like if you go, I love traveling and going where the music's created. Like, you know, the blues in the old days or drum and fife music, which even predates the blues in, 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 in Mississippi, like they were almost like raves, right? People would show up in the field and the musicians would play and they'd just jam and people would party. And these songs weren't three and a half minutes necessarily. You know, uh, a lot of them were just jams, right? And, and, and they were, they served the context of just people drinking and partying, uh, you know, some of that music. And then, you know, but then now you, then you have like the LP, right? So you have the, well, well, before we release our music, we're creating a set of eight to, eight to 10 songs that are about this length and they go in kind of this order and always the last song and the A side is the one that's really the interesting, more artistic, unusual one. And it's a certain way. And then there's a CD. Now we're creating 78 minutes of material instead of 45, 44, or 45 minutes of material. So it's changed the way the medium changes the way the artists work. And now we're on Spotify. So what's going to be the song that's going to get the most listens? And I can just release a song and not release an album. To release an album, maybe that's even a little bit retro or, or kind of old school, or I can just release EPs. They're great artists who just release EPs and never release a full album. Uh, and it changes. And now my goal as an artist is to get my music on the Spotify, whatever, New Music Monday or whatever it's called on the Spotify playlist. So the goal is getting that song on the Spotify playlist and people add it to their Spotify things and that gets a lot of streams. So, so as technology changes, uh, so too does the way the artist work and the way we consume music. Yeah, that's very, very true. And I, I liked, and I think I had thought about uh, the way that you took it all the way back to when music, you know, before music was recorded, because it's in terms of the great history of humanity, it's pretty recently that we've been consuming recorded music, which is pretty mind blowing considering the, the huge role it plays in our lives. Um, before we run out of time, I want to ask yeah. uh, who is Lefty Frizzle and why did you choose Long Oh Night? my God. <laughs> did you listen to that? I haven't listened. I didn't get that oh, far in the yeah. playlist. So, you know, you're going to, you, I'm going to have to uh, see or not whether or not I agree with, uh, although it seems, it seems like this is an older artist. So I, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm probably going li to like this. I you know, I, it was the old, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you how I discovered this song because it speaks to what you're talking about. When I started out as like a music writer, I was at the, I was, I think I was interning at the Village Voice, and Robert Crisco was the big critic, you know, at the time. You know, the uh, like he was the the dean of rock critics. They called, you know, they still call him, I think. Um, and uh, and he was leaving town, and he had some cats, and he wanted me to baby like to cat sit at his house. He's like, you can record whatever music you want. You know, this was basically, you know, there wasn't access to music on YouTube and, and Spotify and, and, and uh, Pandora and everything. So all of a sudden I went to his house with all his albums lining the walls. And I went through his, uh, his um, uh, consumer guides where he rate music. And I found like the music he recommended the most. And I listened to it and recorded it all. If you asked me before then what kind of music I liked, I'd say any music but country. And then I listened, then I put on Lefty Frizzell, Long Black Veil. And uh, the song, that's when I get the chills when I mention these, they really connect with you. Uh, the song begins 10 years ago on a cold, dark night. There was someone killed neath a town hall light. There are few at the scene, but they all agree that the slayer who ran looked a lot like me. And, and, and you re eventually realize as you're hearing the song, I remember just like opened up my heart. I started like crying for some reason. You actually realize as you, as you keep listening to the song, that he was, you know, he's at his trial. He goes, I spoke not a word, though I know it meant my life, for I'd been in the arms of my best friend's wife. But first of all, what great writing. Um, and so, so as not to reveal the secret, he's either hung or whatever for the crime. And the whole, I can't, I can't, I can't still get the chills again, the whole song is told from beyond the grave. And the lyric is, you know, she walks these hills in a long black veil. 
you know, uh, and that's the woman who he had the affair with who's visiting him in the grave. So it's sung from beyond the grave. I don't know why it's such a powerful song. Uh, and you might not cry when you hear it. I don't know, something's just hit me. It's not, you know, it's necessarily a sad song. It's just very powerful. And I heard that and it just opened the floodgates. And then I started getting into all the old early country and there is Tub and all the greats, uh, you know, Johnny Cash. And I remember I was stationed in Nashville for the New York Times for a little bit. And I got to meet the, the woman who wrote that song. I think it was two people, if I remember correctly, or maybe it was just her. Um, and that was like one, just one of those great experiences. Wow, that's incredible. And, yeah, and you'll see again, if you look like like uh, everyone again from the Chieftains, I don't know why Johnny Cash, Johnny Cash covered everything. So many great songs, you know, so many great artists and songs. But, but there's so many great, there's so many covers of that, but the Lefty Frizzell version, his voice is so deep and resonant is like the version and the original. I think the first, I think the first recorded version. Yeah, well, I, I've, I've saved uh, Amer American Originals, which is on Spotify, at least that's where Long uh, Black Veil is. Uh, so I, I'm good. That, is, is there an album uh, uh, by him that you would recommend as well, starting with? You could just do like one of those kind of greatest hit. I think I forget what it is, but it's the whatever the greatest hits collection or something like that. I think it is, it's going to be that American Originals one. I reckon that's a compilation. It's the, the Lefty, the Lefty Frizzell one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just make sure, yeah, just make sure you get the original. But you'll tell by the quality of the recording. Also with the Leuven Brothers' Long Black Veil, make sure you get the original one off Tragic Songs of Life. Later, Charlie Leuven covered it in the harmonies, and later maybe they did it in some versions. Oh, the harmonies aren't quite the same. Knoxville Girl, yeah. Of Knoxville Girl, yeah. And, and uh, Chris Bell, uh, the, so Chris Bell, by the sounds of things, uh, or by the looks of things, he re released one album in 2016. Who is Chris Bell? Why, why, I am the Cosmo, why did the song I Am The Cosmos resonate with you? Uh, and what's the story there? Why, why has Chris made one album in 2016 and not done anything since? Yeah, and I, I think it was earlier from that. That must be the reissue. It's a, it's um, a, it's a reissue. Yeah, yeah. So Chris Bell was in, was in Big Star, that kind of seminal ah, right. band with Alex Chilton, right. right? And uh, and and uh, did a solo album. Then I think he passed away in a car crash, you know, pretty pretty young. And he made this one great album. And the reason I got into it was I was into like that. There's a band, This Mortal Coil. Do you know them at all? It was sort of like one of those four AD bands around the time of the Cocteau Twins and all that. Uh, oh, okay, and, yeah. And I kind of got into them. And then uh, they put out a box set. And one album, one CD was called the originals which is the original versions of all the songs they cover and it is i think there's a spotify playlist of this mortal coil originals just this mortal coil is good but just skip it for now and go to the originals and they were like tim buckley song to the siren pearls and swine the jeweler which is an obscure song but on esp records but is mind-blowing uh roy harper you know who is a big influence on led zeppelin um uh this colin newman from wire the solo song called alone piano a solo piano version of it but their music they covered yeah is uh the apartments mr somewhere these are already obscure but write all these down to this in the playlist but these songs were just phenomenal phenomenal and i could and i'm yeah and i'm pretty sure that i got into chris bell yeah chris bell and the cosmos that way uh and it begins and it's just a really interesting production and very like rebellion reverby and and uh and he's kind of got this beautiful pop a little bit of a whine in the voice and every night I tell myself I am the cosmos and it's just this great thing about being alone and solipsism and there's a grandiosity to it and a deep loneliness to it and almost like Cesaria Vora with the happy sad the 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 loneliness and the grandiosity together and I may be interpreting it wrong it may be my interpretation of it because I've never really dug into the lyrics but it just really resonated with me that one may not be for everyone but I love it yeah well I, I'm really looking forward to listening to it uh oh. That, that was that was that and uh, Lefty Frizzell I did not get to and I did not also get to Soul Clan uh, oh. so Soul Clan looks pretty interesting uh -huh. as well so, yes so uh, who were Soul Clan oh man this is the, this is the most unbelievable song like anyone who likes like 60s soul like you know Otis Redding Wilson Pickett Solomon Burke gotta listen to this song this is like the greatest song this is this is a song that I was with, uh, I did a piece on the Backstreet Boys back when I was in the New York Times. And, uh, and I played them this song. I said, you want to hear like an amazing super group of like the soul, like, I don't know how it came up. And, like sat, sat in my car and played them this song. Like, um, and what it was, was uh, I think it was Atlantic Records. They decided to do a super group of all the greatest soul singers at the time. And, you know, Solomon Burke, Joe Tex, 
Don Covey. I think I think it's, I think it's Don Covey that John Lennon said he'd like learned how to sing from the way he learned to play guitar from Chuck Berry. Uh, um, you know, I think it was Wilson Pickett, but all, all the greats. Uh, and they got together to record an album, but I think it was too many egos in one room. So they only got two songs out before it just imploded. But that's how it feels. And listen, that's how it feels. The B side didn't love as much. I think it's called Soul Meeting, but that's how it feels. Like you hear each, each artist steps in and takes a verse and they're each trying to outdo each other on the verse. It almost sounds like that's the way I interpret it. And so each verse they're trying to like hit home and sing it harder. And then on the choruses, on the choruses, they all chime in and do it a little bit differently each time. But it's like each each one man like is like just like a it's like a superstar stepping up to the plate and like knocking a home run. Then the next like greatest player in the world steps at the plate and knocks the next home run, the next verse, and each one gets better and more powerful. It's and they're almost out trying to outdo each other with the stories of their tough childhood, you know. And man, the Joe Tex version, they're they're all so good. You've got to like all the all these songs we're talking about. Like you really have to just, you don't have to, but just to, to really listen with focus to these songs and not play them in the background, but really try to absorb them the first time you hear them. There's, I can't, yeah, yeah. you've got to call me after you listen to these. I want to hear your thoughts on them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I the soul clan uh, lineup, I mean, those are some of my favorites. So I, I can't believe that I haven't, and this is why I love doing this podcast so much is because it introduces me to new things that you can't, you can't discover new music just through algorithms and just through computer programs. You have to speak to people with taste. I mean, this is an incredible yeah. lineup of uh, singers. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, yeah, I, that is one that I look particularly interesting. The the one, that, another one that I hadn't uh, heard of before uh, is Marmalade. Oh, oh man, really? Yeah. You'll know when you hear it. You'll, when you hear it, you will 100% have heard it. It's one of those classic, I think, like 60 songs. Where, where I th it's reflections of my life, right? Yeah, yeah. So well, it, they seem like a 70s, set, like. Or maybe it's early 70s but or 60s. I'm not sure. Late 60s, early 70s. But it's one of those great pop songs. But it's got this, wisp, it's got this wistfulness to it. That's like just so. And again, it starts out and it sounds like one of those classic, like, you know, golden nuggets or whatever. Uh and then as it goes on, it just has such, such depth to it. And, and I like these very cosmic, big picture songs, you know, like Johnny Cash's cover of Cat Stevens' Father and Son and stuff that really get into their very big, big uh, emotions. I almost want to look up the lyrics, but I, but I won't waste our uh, time doing it. But um, it, it really just hits me hard and it's just so beautiful yeah well you'll know I, it when you hear it you'll know it and you may have not you may have heard it but not listened to it right there's been hearing music and listening to it it's yeah. one of those songs that i heard for a while when i listened to it it really hit me yeah i i completely it really resonates with me what you're saying about listening to music properly i i struggle with music in uh i mean i, I like music at parties and all the rest of it but like when it's just kind of music on in the background and it's something really good and everybody's just chatting like I like to either talk or listen to music and really like engage with whatever I'm doing. I'm not a big, uh, just put something crap on in the background without much thought type of person, which is probably yeah. a slightly overly intense way uh, to think about music. Neil, it's been a real honor to talk to you. I wanted to- oh, wait, I got, I, By the way, before we wrap, I have one question. There's one song yeah. I'm curious if you heard because I thought it was, I don't say the most obscure one, probably the most unlikely song on, on the list was the Lucinda Williams, Drunken Angel. Yeah, I'd already heard, I'd already heard that song, but- uh, yeah because Lucinda Williams uh, is not, you know, not a particularly like famous artist, but for some reason uh, I discovered uh, like some album back in 2007 called West. Yeah. And I just ended up going through, cause I, I'm quite, uh, I just go through people's discographies when I like something. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I'd ended up uh, hearing that before, but why did you choose that? that yeah, I want to mention, cause I want to mention, this is really, it's funny now we're just talking to you, but, but, uh, but um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's from Car Wheels on a Gravel Road. I think that and West are my favorite albums of hers, but that one makes me cry every time I hear it because it's about a guitar player of hers uh, that got, again, this is just from memory. So hopefully correct, that got killed in a bar fight, you know? And, and so, so knowing that, and then she writes this song, <laughs> you know, the chills again. It's so funny because, you know, this, the reason I really connect with music going back to the beginning is emotions are complex and they're complicated. 
And that's why I think I like the even reflections of my life too. They have these contrasts, they have these happy, sad, tragic, joyful, all these things. And here she's angry at him. Like she's angry at him. Why'd you have to let go of your guitar? Why'd you have to like, I forget, take it that far, you know? You know, she's like, there's an anger at him. She's like, well, you fuck up. This didn't have to happen. Like, why did you do this? She's angry at him for this happening. While of course she's tragic and, and sad and really hurt. And I think it's true just to have that emotion. It's the only song I've heard that that really, you know, maybe listeners can think of others that really had that that nuance of that emotion. Uh, and I, and if you listen to it, that knowing that she's lost her guitar player in a bar fight and she's writing the song to him and she's angry at him for being in the situation it really hits you yeah i mean that's that that song is not one that i would have you know i, I wouldn't have been able to explain the meaning like that uh, I, I had no idea i did like that album when i listened to it before but i'm gonna have to revisit car wheels on a gravel road because uh you know that's quite an extraordinary story yeah, yeah. I wanted to uh, ask ask you briefly, um, not related to music, but uh, yeah, I read uh, when I was much younger, when I was like, I don't know, 15 or not 15, 17, uh, I read the game and uh, uh -huh. and uh, how do you how do you look back on on that uh, on that book now and um, how 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 long you know do do you think that there's still some there's still some very sage advice there for people looking to get some confidence because everybody read it uh, at sc at school and uh, I think it gave a lot of people a lot of confidence and if and they they used the advice in in the right way everybody I know just used it to gain a bit more like confidence in social situations and um used it in a kind of like compassionate way and i don't know it helped i feel like it helped a lot of people so you look back on on writing that positively obviously it it was an extremely successful book like all of your books have ended up uh, being so is that something that you're still very proud of yeah the, the answer the answer is i, I don't the answer is I, I don't know and i'll tell you what i mean by that two things one is when i think of my own life experience the experience i went through there like really I, I couldn't be here having an articulate interview with you if I didn't go through the experience of the game in the sense that it opened me up to self-improvement. It opened me up to learning how to just talk better, learning how to speak better, learning how to uh, dealing with self-esteem issues. Uh, and, it may, and maybe the game isn't the whole journey. I mean, the game maybe is the first steps on the longer journey I've been on. And so, so for me personally, you know, again, you know, for me personally, even though there are a lot of problematic things about the, you know, about the book and the culture itself, like I'm a better person for the experience. And at the same time, you know, uh, I haven't looked at the book since, and I probably would be unable to read it. I would probably want to, who knows what my reaction would be. Uh, and the reason why I haven't looked at it again is something Rick Rubin once said, going back to music is, uh, is he talks about like, you know, uh, an album or a book is a chapter in your life. It's not the whole, your whole statement of who you are. And this maybe speaks to creators where we just, people spend so long and they think this is it. It's just a chapter in your life and it captures who you are at that moment. And then you grow past it and your next book's your next chapter, next book's your next chapter. So I, I know for a fact, I disagree with a lot of what's in the game today. You know, uh, I know for a fact there's, it's problematic on like so many levels, not, with what I believe now, not even with where the culture is at, let alone, but just talking from my own personal opinion. Uh, even though at the time, I, maybe my intentions were uh, share, to share this experience, the good and the bad of it, and to be journalistic about it, in the sense that here's what the culture was, here's what I learned, here's how it helped me, here's how it hurt me, here's how it maybe helped other people, here's how it hurt other people, and to really show, and at the, in the end, you know, leaving that world and, and, and talking about the toxicity of, all these fake alpha males living in a house. It's, what's that? Uh, of um, uh, um, I forget the word. That's a, there's almost a word in the culture now. I'm blanking out for some reason because shifting the gears for music. But uh, but it was sort of a chapter in my life, and that I got to document. And if I documented it now, if I went back and changed it, it wouldn't be that chapter. So the goal is just each book is a new chapter that's true to who I am and what I think at that time, and hopefully keep growing and are embarrassed by everything you ever did. I'll tell you one last story to kind of wrap this up. Um, 
I was at a dinner once and there were a bunch of musicians there. Uh, and I know I, I don't remember how I started this conversation, but it might've been a, a bunch of very, uh, you know, different music who's, who's collect, who's, uh, whose repertoire we all know are familiar with. And we got in this conversation and we went around the table and all of them rated their albums from like maybe their, you know, maybe their, like their five biggest albums or whatever on a scale of one to 10. And these are people, again, who have like, you know, top 10 albums. And they went through and they're like, yeah, that one was a five, that one was an eight, that one's a two, that one's a 10, you know, and they went through and the way their relationship with their work is they may not love them all. And when we, what they thought was a two was other people's favorite work. You know, and, and I think you release everything when you release it. You think that it's the best thing that you've ever done. And then you move on and grow and look back at it and are embarrassed by it. And that means you're growing. And I'll end with this interesting story. Um, or I don't know if it's interesting, but I used to review music for Rolling Stone and uh, the New York Times. And I reviewed an album by AFI. Do you know that band? And I, they'd done an album called Sing the Sorrow that I loved. I thought it was amazing. Their new album, I want to say it was Miss Misery. Maybe that's a single, I can't remember. And I'd reviewed it for Rolling Stone and I didn't like it as much. So maybe I gave it like, I don't know, three and a half stars. I don't know. Uh, and I was out and the, I saw the singer, Davey Havoc, I think is, yeah, Davey. And, and, and uh, I said, hey, I just want to let you know, I review, you know, did this review the album in Rolling Stone. I felt this and I shared my feelings about it with him. He goes, well, I get that you think that, but I think this is like the best album we ever recorded. And I'm really, really proud of it. And when he said that, uh, I realized like, who, who the fuck am I to say whether an album's three and a half stars or five stars or one star, like what arrogance that is. Everyone who releases something is proud of it, you know, and thinks it's the greatest thing they ever did and, and, and it's meaningful to them and it finds an audience that really connects with it. So for me to say that I'm the ultimate judge of that is so arrogant. So going back to maybe the game in a sense that, well, I'm embarrassed I ever reviewed anything that I would never change those reviews. Uh, I just realized that maybe, uh, um, you know, who is someone to say that? There's a great, mm. haven't, there's a great, do you know that Lou Reed album, uh, Take No Prisoners Live? I would have listened to it, but I wouldn't recall it off the top of my head. You, then, you ha then you haven't listened because you would recall this. By the way, on the recommendation list, listen to Take No Prisoners Live, Walk on the Wild, just listen to Walk on the Wild Side, but it's a Lou Reed album recorded live at the bottom line. And he's like super messed up. And every song, he's like super fucked. He's got to be super fucked up because every song, like the band's vamping and he's go talking and he's going off in tangents, almost like a stand-up comedy album. But he talks about Robert Criscow, circling back to Robert Criscow. And he's like, who is this guy with this consumer guide to music? It's like, you know, you give me a B plus for this album. Fuck you. You're like giving me a B plus. Like, who are you to rate my sh shit? And, and, and he's really, even though he's kind of coming off a little bit, whatever, he's really right there, you know? And so, and so I, so after that, I never reviewed another thing again, another album again. So th that was why you stopped. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. I guess there is an arrogance to it all. I think a lot of great musicians, Kind of feel that about uh critics and sometimes you think they're being a bit overly defensive but then at the end of the day when someone's put their heart and soul into something it's so much easier to just write a few hundred words about it than it is to spend two years trying to create something so there's yeah. definitely uh some good reasoning behind what you're saying but uh with regards to the game uh again like i i agree with you know who the fuck is anyone to uh to review anything <laughs> so i'm not attempting to review the game uh, but I will say that I, I think, you know, read in the right way and applied in the right way, it's it's a it's a fucking great book. And uh, and uh, I think for a lot of people who are struggling, you, you know, provided you you're not a misogynistic uh, person, uh, and if you just genuinely want to uh, get a bit more confident and grow a bit and be able to even you know have a conversation uh, with a member of the opposite or the same sex uh, depending on who you're attracted to without uh you know urinating in your pants out of fear then uh it's a great book it will get, teach you a bit about about social interactions and maybe there's some things that you change about it but it's definitely an interesting read it's it was definitely more interesting uh to to me and many of my classmates than the prescribed reading uh, <laughs> yeah meant to be yeah, reading I, I... For academic studies instead yeah, no, I got a lot of emails at the time saying I've never read a book front to back before. But it's interesting because as you're talking about it in my head, I'm thinking, oh, I'm now, it's like, I'm thinking, I'm literally, it's like somebody, it's like, a, you know, talking to artists about a genre that they've, it's like in my head, I'm thinking, oh, because now I would say, if you ask me for advice about that stuff, I'd go, I'd say, get to the underlying issues. 
I'd say it has nothing to do with, with, uh, with uh, um, being socially shy to talk to other people. I'd say it has to do with underlying shame. I'd say the underlying shame comes from the way you were raised. So I'd say throw all that. I'd literally today, I would say throw all that out and like go work on the underlying issues of did you have a really critical parent? Did you have an absent parent? Uh, did you have a controlling parent? Did these cause you to not feel like you're enough around other people and then have to learn techniques in order to talk to them because you feel inside like you're not enough. So treat that. And then not only will you be able to talk with people, but you'll actually have, you'll have incredible relationships afterwards because you heal the deeper wound. So it's interesting how we grow and change from, from what we think. This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics. Dare to sound different.